Welcome CX Insights Rockstars. We have a wonderful guest today, Kajuli Tanka from Microsoft. And our topic today is how to build high performance internal insights teams. Let me quickly introduce Kajoli. She heads up consumer product research for Microsoft, working on brands like Surface, Search, Microsoft 365 or Windows. And she has a master's in market research that most of us don't have <laughs> and two decades in understanding what consumers really feel and why. And actually, Kajuli is very passionate about building strong, high-performance teams. And this uh, is the reason why she's here uh, and we selected this topic. Welcome, Kajuli. Hi, thank you so much, Frank. I'm so glad to be here. So when, when I uh, informed myself about you, I stumbled a, across a fact, you actually have a master's in forestry. So is this uh, helpful in the research space? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's a little, so that was my first master's. So I had a master's in forestry and this was when I had come out of college, it's full of a lot of ideals and wanted to make the world a better place. So I, at that time, I was just like 21 years old, you know, and so I got this master's in forestry and it was a very interesting experience. But, you know, I stumbled into market research by accident almost after that, because at that point in time, I was so idealistic that it took very little time for me to get disillusioned. Now to your actual question, which is um, what have you learned from forestry that has, uh, you know, that you can take to research? I learned a lot from um my master's in forestry. I mean, a lot of that is to do with how much we're in, you know, harmony with the world, part of an ecosystem, not just not the rulers of the ecosystem. I think just that perspective is really helpful in business because in any large company like Microsoft, you're a small part of a giant ecosystem. So just having that perspective ingrained is really good. Second, uh, when I was doing my master's in forestry, one of the techniques we had learned was uh, a technique called joint forest management. So this is the idea that the forest is a natural resource that is owned by everyone. And because it's a common property, it actually suffers from the tragedy of the commons where people take, but don't give back. So one of the things we learned was how to make all the stakeholders who are interested in uh, getting resources from the forest sort of accountable to take care of it as well. And I think that particular technique, joint forest management, where you are trying to influence people across a variety of organizations uh, and you are trying to get them to a common objective that is really not in their short-term need, that doesn't fulfill their short-term need, I think that technique is marvelous in a, in a large organization because you're frequently, you know, if you're going to be successful and if you're going to be effective in your goals, you're going to have to learn how to work across organizations that really you have no power over. So how, yeah. how do you do that then? How, how do you make uh, the, the stakeholders treat the company as a forest? Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, uh, the, most, of our, most of the times that difficulties happen in large organizations, it's usually due to failure to communicate. You know, most people are really trying to do a good job and most people at Microsoft you know, are the nicest people, nicest and smartest people I've ever met. But sometimes there's a failure to communicate. So by creating the vision for what their work will actually end up contributing to, mm. by being a servant to the cause, not by making, you know, myself the ruler of the cause, and by aligning to, uh, you know, one goal that we all want to accomplish. I think that's the way you kind of make it work. You know, people, you have to, you have to call to people's uh, larger cells. And, you know, everybody has them. I mean, in, I feel kind of blessed in Microsoft. I feel like there are a lot of like very nice people who are very smart, who are trying to do their own thing. It's just like sometimes your objectives aren't aligned. So if you align the objectives to the greater good of Microsoft, people kind of get, you know, people kind of get into that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I think that one technique, the joint forest management, I think that has really kind of helped me. I think also, you know, as a um, as one part of the system, I think a lot of times, people spend a lot of time feeling frustrated about how things should be. You know, so I think that really reduces your own energy and effectiveness. And I feel like having had training 
in being powerless and yet making things move forward, I think I don't waste all this time thinking things should be a certain way. Uh, people need to be this way. Everyone needs to think how amazing you know my idea is. Like I just don't have any of that, but I try to work. I try to be a servant leader and try to get things moving forward. So I think that's that's something I've learned because of my masters in forest. You know, someday I feel like I'll go back to my uh, my roots. Uh, you know, but for now I'm having a great time in research. Cool. I wasn't expecting that my question was so good, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> revealing. Um, Let's let's further jump into the topic. Uh, how did you um, basically? How did your passion evolved in building high high performance teams? You know, I think uh, what what happens is when you start in your career, you're very focused on um, you know yourself. Like you are, you know, you make yourself really big in your own mind. You think through yourself. And you know, once you start working in a team, you can go one of two ways. You can either be a person that activates the whole team or you can be a person who leads the team from front. And I have seen over time, the results I've gotten from when the team is truly activated are exponentially to what I would achieve on my own. You know, I can start out with an idea and then I find like, you know, my idea uh, for, uh, you know, kind of my idea for, for whatever the project is, I feel like if I incorporate my team members' ideas in it, it's like exponentially so much better. So then I kind of slowly started to shift and um, kind of really get to uh, activating my team members and being a servant leader. And I think once I saw the power of that, there's no going back. There's no going back to being very ego-centered and just trying to do you know, your own thing. You're just like, you try to be the power behind the group. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, basically the power to to your own impact. So now yeah. let's uh, please share uh, the secrets of how, how to make it work. Yes. Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, I've been evolving my own management style, and this honestly may not speak to everyone, but uh, you know, this book um, called Radical Candor by Kim Scott really influenced me. So she has this concept where she says you have to both personally care and directly challenge your team if you want them to rise. And I, she has this idea that if you care too much for their feelings and don't give them the right feedback, they're really not going to do uh, that well. So you can be, so my personal flaw was I used to be in the zone of ruinous empathy. You know, where I used to worry so much about the feelings of everybody that I would never tell them the hard feedback that they needed to hear. Sometimes when I was a very early career manager, I used to, in fact, find it easy to just do the work myself, you know, instead of like burdening my team. Because I was just like, oh, this is not working out right. Let me just like, you just have to do it yourself. And I think, you know, kind of learning about that that zone is in the zone of ruinous empathy, where your empathy is actually hobbling your team members and getting out of it, I think that was step one in trying to figure out how do you build high performing teams. I think second is trying to be, you know, the kind of manager that the people that that your team members need. So when you are, uh, you know, leading uh, kind of junior team members, they might need a lot of guidance. But when you come to my stage and when you are actually managing leaders, you have to lead in a very different kind of way. So having EQ to shift your leadership gear as your scale changes, I think that's really important. So I give a lot of, so the, to the directors who report into me, I give them a lot of independence. So, uh, you know, a lot of the times, you know, we say that we want our leaders to be leaders, but we don't actually allow them to lead in, in our behaviors. So when they make mistakes, we can be, um, you know, over chastising, uh, we can give them too much advice. So it's very hard to sometimes step back and let them lead. So the second thing is, I would say, giving a ton of independence, uh, you know, and then uh, I would say the third thing to be like a really uh, great team leader is um, just, you know, making your people feel valued. I think a lot of times, sometimes if you have, you know, all of us have insecurities and most of us leaders have insecurities too. So I think sometimes when our team members are really good, we can sometimes be a little bit insecure about their own skill and we don't want to show them that they're really good. So just recognizing that that's a crappy side of yourself that you are going to have to overcome. You can feel whatever you feel, but you have to behave in the way that benefits the team. So I think that's the piece, like making as they're, as your 
as your like leaders are growing, you have to tell them how valued they are. Like don't get threatened by their growth. Because I think, I think that's what leads to a truly high, that, and then they are able to cascade that onto their teams. So I would say, you know, having radical candor, um, giving independence, and then appreciating people. I think these qualities are, I don't know what's happening in Germany, but in the US, we are certainly having the great musical chairs. You know, so we're seeing uh, people kind of move, you know, out of organizations and move into new organizations. There's a lot of like great musical chairs happening right now. Um, so having said that, it's even more important that the people who report to you, they really want to be there. Yeah, yeah um, at least we see that in the agency space where basically, yeah, people were working because they were part of a cool team and they could go there and play kicker every day. And now in Hope Office, is this... Yes. Uh, all the, also, the team value basically doesn't work out anymore, right? So, yeah. and actually, this brings me to this, this other question, uh, also related to the first point you mentioned, Uh, what I learned is, or not learned, but uh, saw, saw this in, in literature that the key predictor for uh, performance or for job satisfaction is actually that you are have a good relationship with your boss, right? So, uh, yeah. uh, much more important than many, most other things. And um, your first point was basically kind of challenging that because of course you know really need to be honest and and also challenging to your yes your team member right so uh, how how do you see this uh yeah this piece of advice or, or research i i found yeah so i think i want to challenge the assumption that you're making frank here which is that if you challenge your direct they actually do feel less cared for. My experience is they actually feel more cared for because what happens is you have to first build a foundation of a very strong relationship and then you can start to challenge. And then they must never be in doubt that what you're doing when you're challenging them is you're trying to raise them to the next level. You know, so sometimes with my directs, I'll even be vulnerable and say, hey, I'm really hesitant in giving you this feedback because I'm worried it'll make you feel like I'm criticizing you. However, I feel like if you were to do this in this particular way instead of this particular way, you would activate in a whole new way. And I feel like having built a relationship first and uh, then kind of being vulnerable in moments, but also directly challenging them so they know that I'm on their side, but I'm doing what I'm doing for what a bigger vision I have for them. I think that's the trick. The other part, Frank, you didn't ask, but I think that is just like the reality of hybrid work environments. You know, you're talking about, um, you know, uh, the great musical chairs in our industry right now. And it looks like it happens in, uh, is happening in, in Germany too, uh, in your world of like, how do you keep employees? I actually think there is no way around it right now. You know, because the tools we have to bond within, uh, you know, within the team to make the team feel essentially like part of a tribe. We just don't have them in the hybrid world. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of think like, hey, should we play? Should we do kind of like games in the evening? But, you know, people are so tired of screen time all day because the way life is structured is that you have screens all day. Your entertainment is also, you know, maybe binging something on Netflix or, you know, kind of what you're reading your Kindle. So you're basically your eyes are going from screen to screen to screen. So they don't really like a virtual thing doesn't kind of really replace what we used to have in person when you could like, go to the bar and hang out or, uh, you know, have some kind of Microsoft event where people would be wearing, you know, those t-shirts and those jackets that kind of make you, they were all very important. So I don't think there's a good surrogate for that in the virtual world. I really don't know. I mean, like, do you have any suggestions of like a good surrogate that doesn't involve like just virtual? No, I, I think uh, you cannot replace a uh, real world, real world. I mean, you don't, need to meet every day actually that could be uh bad as well right yeah it's, but I it's, think, it's uh, if you i think quality is even more important than quantity yeah so if you meet once a year but then do a big party and uh go crazy right so one-time experiences which are very human and very intense i guess this creates a great bond and 